welcome. Uh, this is the play team from TypeSafe talking about Play 2.3 and beyond. Uh, I'm, I'm Peter Vluchter. I've been at TypeSafe for a few years now. Um, I was actually there before TypeSafe. I was originally on the Acker team. And just recently, I've joined these guys, James, Christopher, and Rich, on the play team. Uh, we're, we're all based on the other side of the world, in Australia and New Zealand. So Play 2.3 was released uh, really recently, on May 31st, after about eight months uh, since Play 2.2. And there have been a lot of contributions from the community. We've had 168 people contributing to Play 2.3. 132 of those were uh, new contributors. So we've got a really active and very awesome community. Um, there's just the four of us within TypeSafe, but a lot of the work is being done uh, from the other committers. And we've had actually four new committers during this time that are new to the core team. Um, these guys have done a lot of awesome work on Play 2.3. So a big welcome to Cedric, Arthur, Ben, and Greg. It's uh, really good to have you working on stuff. So what I'm going to do is give a quick overview of Play 2.3 uh, new features and highlights, and then we're going to dive in deeper into a few of those aspects, and then we'll talk about what's coming next. So one of the biggest changes that we've made, one of the big improvements is around asset management, so client-side assets like JavaScript and CSS. So previously, we had built-in support in the SVT plugin for CoffeeScript, less, and some optimization. And we've taken this, we've separated it out, we've improved it, and we've made it easier to build on top of it, make it extensible. And we've got several SBT plugins there already, and the ecosystem is currently growing. So this is something we're going to focus on a little bit later, and Christopher's going to go into more detail. We've also got uh, really good Java 8 support. So Play has always been both a Scala and a Java web framework. We try and have everything have first-class support in both languages. Uh, we've gone through and checked Play 2.2 will also work very well with Java 8. We've also enhanced some of the APIs. So here we have a new Lambda accepting method for WebSockets, and it's starting to look a lot more like the Scala code as well. And an ongoing feature through the previous three releases has been uh, focusing on performance. And in Play 2.3, we really focused on the Java performance a lot more, which was trailing the Scala performance in some places. So Rich is going to go into more detail and talk about that as well. But we want both Play and Scala to be uh, equal in their performance. Previously, Play was tied to one particular Scala version. So Play 2.3 is also the first uh, play release where we cross-compile against Scala 2.11 and 2.10. So we don't specify which Scala version. You can now just put it in your build and it will work. So everything's cross-compiled, including the modular libraries like Twirl and Play Slick is also going to be uh, cross-compiled soon. Anorm has been receiving a lot of uh, awesome improvements. So Cedric, one of the new core committers, has been working on this and it's getting better and better. So big thanks to him. And also, uh, web services has seen a lot of improvements. It's now pluggable. You can have multiple clients. It's a lot more configurable. And Will Sargent, down here, from Professional Services at TypeSafe, has been doing that work. So that's really cool. An ongoing theme for 2.3 is modularization. SPT Web is one. Twirl Play Slick is going to stay as a separate module so that these can be developed faster. Twirl has been broken out. The Play template engine has been broken out from Play and is a separate project that has its own SPT plugin, so you can use it outside of Play. It also has an optimized parser, which has been contributed from the Scala IDE team, and they're using that in the Play plugin and Scala IDE. And one of the, the, the big changes as well in terms of downloading Play and using it, the Play command and the Play distribution have been replaced by Activator. So this brings improvements, brings tutorials, and it brings a web UI, and this is going to be continuing to improve and become a more and more useful development tool. And we've actually created an Activator template that goes through all the highlights in Play 2.3. So you can download that, you can look through the tutorial, you can try it out, and right now we're actually going to dive into that in a little more detail and show you some of the cool things. So, Christopher. Thanks, Pete. Um, 
I'm sure glad they turned on the air conditioning in here. It was just after lunch, coming in here for the previous session, and it's warm. Was anyone in that session? Did anyone fall asleep? I'm just curious. So I'm pleased that none of you are going to fall asleep now, because it's tantalizing stuff. So what we have over here. Um, so first of all, I just want to, uh, again, just build on something that Pete just said. Why have we done this, SBT Web? Why did we do this? And the world of JavaScript and libraries associated also with CSS and HTML, it changes every week. Let's face it, there's a new library out there. It's a new great build tool. And so prior to Play 2.3, we were very opinionated. You know, we thought that CoffeeScript was going to take over the planet and that less was all you needed for CSS. But of course, this is not the way the world works. So we wanted an architecture. There's a lot of smiling around here because we all know it. Um, so we wanted an architecture that would allow us to um, cater for all of these new great things that come out every three days, four days. And, and that's really then why we did this. But of course, you know, we still support uh, CoffeeScript and less and require JS today, you know, as first class citizen, citizens in this architecture. So what I want to show you here is this uh, a application that we're looking at right now is the Play 2.3 feature tool, Activator Template. So you can all go and get that. You can go Activator New, and then you, know, you get your standard selection of four. Uh, but you can say Play Tab, and then you'll see a Dash 2.3 feature tool, right? And off you go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you had to figure it out. All right, so what I want to show you on here, a couple of things. If I highlight this paragraph, and do an inspect element, you'll see that over here, um, relating to the CSS declarations, uh, we have a less file, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. Web browsers don't understand less. They don't understand CoffeeScript or anything like that. Yet, here we are. We can see less source code, and this is achieved through something called source maps. All right? so. In prior to 2.3, um, we did not support source maps in play. Thus, if you minified your assets, which of course you do because you're great web citizens, then you're stuffed. You know, you're going to be dealing with minified code when you have a look at it in the browser. And so because of source maps, uh, what actually happens there is at the bottom of your CSS file, uh, you know, it'll have a little URL. In fact, actually, I might even be able to show you on here. Uh, it doesn't actually show you. Oh, they, uh, it, it doesn't really show you. Okay, thank you. Right, so if I look at main CSS and I scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see a little comment. Gosh, doesn't less expand out to a, a little. <laughs> yeah, right, so it's actually importing Bootstrap here as well. Thanks, James. <laughs> James, do you want to get up here? Um, <laughs> all right. Jeez, there we go, there we go, it's right at the bottom. Right, there, all right, and that tells it to go to the source map, and that basically describes how to translate to a list file. Similarly, I can have a look at uh, uh, CoffeeScript, and so if I go into Assets, and bring up controller.coffee, I can do really cool things here, like set a breakpoint in our CoffeeScript. Again, remember, browsers do not understand CoffeeScript. And thus, if I now oops, click on that button, I've set a, so you'll see it's on connect clicked. So if I do that, then we actually set a breakpoint at that line. Again, the browser doesn't understand CoffeeScript. So this is really, really cool stuff. Now, of course, we didn't develop this, but uh, what we enabled were source maps. So if you develop Play 2.3 apps, you've got a first class. JavaScript and CSS experience now. Okay, that's the take home message from that. So let's have a look at and see what we actually have to do then in our project to, uh, to get SBT working. Okay, so here's our little feature tour thing here. The first thing that we do is gonna hide that little, oops, see. 
few things over here. Okay, so the first thing that, that we do is we declare uh, the plugins that we actually need, right? So up here, we're declaring that we need play, and then we're saying that we want CoffeeScript, less JS hint. We use JS hint for making sure semicolons are in the right place with JavaScript. And a few other things, we use require JS optimization. We use a digest plugin for what we call asset fingerprinting, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Hi, mum. <laughs> we use gzip for compression. And finally, we have SBT mocker in there as well for some unit testing, which James will be showing us how to do a little bit later. And then uh, if we look in our build.spt file, and you know, I think the interesting comparison here is that if you do, and, and this is not an attack on Gulp or Grunt or whatever like that, but you, you, know, you should just for a bit of an exercise compare the amount of declaration that you have to make as a user to get this. Um, but what we're doing here, uh, this one statement on line five, where we're saying enab enable plugins, play Scala, will bring all of those SPT web plugins into effect as well, given this new feature of SPT called auto plugins, which I won't go into in great detail. But from your point of view, the benefit is that um, you know, th there's, there's very little in by way of configuration. Another feature of SPT 0.13.5 is that you get auto imports. So things, when you enable these plugins and their dependencies become enabled, you actually get various settings automatically in scope. So you remember in the past where you go, I don't know, gzip settings or play Scala settings and you know, it was a declaration and you build an SPT file, you don't have to do that anymore, that's gone. And so these things like mocker keys, pipeline stages, all just come into scope automatically because that plugin has been enabled. Web jars are a big feature of Play. Um, we see web jars as, as being um, quite nice given that there's a lot of web infrastructure out there in the enterprise already. You know, people have spent, you know, people, enterprise has spent a lot of money on Nexus and Artifactory, you know, to pr proxy these repositories. There's a lot of um, investment in terms of transitive dependency resolution and the algorithms associated with that. You know, so WebGIS leverages all of that. What we've also noticed is that uh, Maven Central um, was like 8 billion downloads year before last, 11 billion downloads last year. You know, it's, it's not getting less, it's getting more. Uh, that said, uh, we also support NPM. Okay, so in fact, by declaration of a package.json file in your project root, um, we actually we actually run NPM uh, from within SPT itself. And it's the pure NPM, there's, there's no change. We actually take that and we run it in JVM on top of Trireme or we can run it externally on Node. So you actually get the benefit of that. And we wanna do a few other things there as well with other packages. You know, so we, again, we wanna be fairly agnostic in that regard. Uh, a couple of uh, other things I just wanna sort of point out with this file, you see this pipeline stages thing here at the bottom? We'll come back to that. You know, but that's the declaration of an asset pipeline. But what we're actually talking about here is uh, we actually talk about the two types of tasks in SPT Web. We talk about what we call source file tasks, and we talk about pipeline stage tasks. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. And they have you know certain method signatures, which is now as of a couple of days ago, I, I put some documentation on SPT Web README, how, what those signatures actually are. They're really quite simple though. And source file tasks basically take like a .js, uh, sorry, like a .coffee and transpile into a .js. So they're resource generators in SPT terms, and they can all execute in parallel. So you know your coffee script, your less, whatever, can all execute in parallel. Your asset pipeline, your pipeline stage tasks, are going to occur in the sequence that actually is declared down here. All right, so let's just have a look at that. So what this is actually saying is that the RJS task is gonna execute first. The input to it is the product of the source file tasks. Okay, so once they've all executed, then we'll get you know, a nice aggregated uh, list of what those, things, what those input files are, those JS and CSS, et cetera. And then 
RGS will basically add and subtract to that, and that becomes the input to the next one. And that's how that works. And they, what's really nice about this is that uh, RGS, Digest, GZIP, and, the, and other ones that we've now written, they don't know anything about each other at all. All they know is you know, the inputs that they actually get. So, moving along. We've talked about source maps. We'll come back to mocker testing. We've talked about the assets uh, pipeline. So, wh what I want to just show you then, again, fairly quickly, I'm, I'm going to kill activator there. So, we've had activator operating in run mode. What I'm going to do here is now go activator start. We've changed what start does for play 2.3. Now, it's semantically the same, but what it actually now does is invoke the SPT native packager. And it stages your app and prepares it for distribution, and then it automatically invokes the script found in the bin directory. Okay? And so that's what it's actually doing here now. And it, it's done all of that. And it's actually executed that entire asset pipeline. So we're not interested in required JS optimization, gzipping, MD5 generation, that kind of stuff for our regular dev loop. Okay? Um, but, of course, when we're preparing something for pr production, we want to you know, minify these things and have gzip compression and asset fingerprinting. So what that now looks like to our application, you can see before... Um, you know, we were getting jQuery.js from our assets lib jQuery folder. We were getting our main CSS file. You know, you can see all these URLs. So if I refresh that now, something interesting has happened here. For a start, we have these interesting names. And so we fingerprinted the names. We've changed them, and we've changed the references to those names in your view HTML files. Okay, so this is all done as part of the uh, reverse router. And what you get for that is um, far future expires. So if we actually click on this, we can see that, first of all, we're delivering gzip, because that SBT gzip thing was in our pipeline. And we're seeing also here that max age is 315-36000, which I think is the number of minutes in the year, but I can't remember. Okay, so RFCs basically say, you know, I mean, we, we could confidently say that this thing is never, ever, 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 ever going to change. Okay? But RFCs say, well, no, you should actually kind of set it to a year. So we kind of think, well, a year is reasonable, right? And the reason we're so confident about that is... The digest, of course, the MD5 that we're generating, we can use SHA-1 or any other digest algorithm as well, and that's configurable. Um, that, of course, you know, is, a, is a fingerprint of the contents itself. So as long as those contents stay the same, then you know, it's, uh, you know, that, that name is going to stay the same as well. So you know, this, other, other frameworks do this as well. Uh, Rails has been doing this for a while as well, but you know, I think we'll... Hopefully you'll agree, you know, we, we do it in a really nice integrated uh, sort of way. And in fact, you've really not had to do anything in your code other than one thing, which I'll come back to very shortly. Okay, so let's go back to our plugin. Uh, we've overhauled required JS optimization significantly. Um, so if you used that before in Play 2.3, things have really changed here a great deal. Um, for the best, for the better, right? I mean, one thing we're doing actually in there is uh, any asset that we download from WebJars, WebJars, are, their, their contents are also now available on a CDN, and we actually go and substitute those CDN URLs in there as well. So again, with very little effort on your part and no change to your source code, you actually get the benefits of CDNs if you use WebJars for free. Oh, if you use RequireJS, that is. So we've talked about um, asset fingerprinting, and if we look at a view.html file, I think I reference it, oh, sorry, here we go. I don't have it running, sorry. Let me just, uh, let's just do that. 
That's my alarm saying I've talked too long. Okay, I just want to I'll quickly just show you then my this view dot uh, this view. Why is there not view coming up anybody? Oh, I can't why anyway, this is Thank you. Okay, but I've got in that tab now anyway. Um, so what I so the only thing so uh, with the reverse router in the past you would just go assets at and you can still do that so we've preserved existing behavior but now if you do assets dot versioned then you'll get that fingerprinted asset rewriting for you automatically and that's all that you have to do and you know typesafe.com and uh, playframework.com have all now moved in this direction and so there's just one other thing that I want to show you before sitting down sorry guys um, one, one of the uh, features that people like about play you know this keeps uh, coming up more than anything else is let me just refresh that I could just make sure it's running is you know how you get your Scala and your Java errors in the browser when you refresh it's probably like the number one feature well with SBT web what we do is we plug in to the same SBT error compilation reporting structure that's a really big sentence wasn't it so if I look at our code here and some JavaScript um, right let's just introduce some syntax error here and then go over here we actually get a compilation error rendered in our browser for JavaScript less and whatever else we write plugins for right now, can anyone see uh, anyone notice a little bit of a bug here oh it's actually working now actually with coffee script was actually reporting the wrong line before anyway I didn't say that now so there you go. So, so that's an advantage of, of that. Um, I di didn't actually introduce myself, by the way. I'll work on the play team in case you didn't um, get that bit. So um, yeah, thanks. So James is going to come up and, and talk about Mocha. OK, so um, yeah, I'm James. I've been working for two years at TypeSafe, almost. And uh, I'm the tech lead of play. and. Yeah, I'm going to talk about Mocha, so I'm going to unstuff up this project that Christopher stuffed up for me. So, um, uh, you guys, I assume, are all fans of Scala, and one of the reasons why you're using Scala is that it's strongly typed. And when something's strongly typed, then it's, it's still important to test, but it's nowhere near as important to test with a dynamic language. But I can guarantee you, if I ask everyone around this room, which has more test your Scala code or your JavaScript code? Anyone have more tests for their JavaScript code? OK, I see one hand. What about more tests for Scala code? Pretty much everyone. So uh, the more important thing to test would be your JavaScript code, but uh, we, provide out, we used to only provide out-of-the-box support for testing Scala code, but that's not true anymore. So we have provided out-of-the-box support for writing mocker tests. So you can see we, we have our, our controller coffee here and it's got some logic doing, you know, controlling the state of the page and um, handling some stuff. We can actually um, kind of, I need to save. We can kind of see that things are working here. It kind of sums these numbers. So there's a business logic in, in there that we want to test. And we also um, have the kind of the display logic separated out. And so what that means is we can quite easily mock things and test things. So I've got this controller spec here. I'm mocking using Squire and I've got some tests here. So let's see this running. Activator is probably not the best way to view tests at the moment. In fact, I don't know actually how to see what the errors were. But you can see here I've got some tests. One of them's failing. And just to show that it's not smoke and mirrors, uh, I'll show you that failing test. 
So that failing test is here where I've put the number 4 there in the input and it should have been 2. Save. Uh, oh, I want to go back to test. And then run it again and it all looks nice. It actually, uh, when you run this in the console, it looks just like running specs tests. So, uh, that's mocker testing. Now the next thing that I wanted to talk about uh, was our new WebSocket actor support. In fact, not just WebSocket actor support. So let's go and have a look at, this is the sum controller that serves the WebSocket. Now the first thing that you notice is this try, ooh, that was funny, try accept. Uh, so previously in play 2.2, uh, when you received a WebSocket connection, your only option was to accept it and if you, if let's say the user wasn't authenticated, what you, could, what you would then do is immediately close it after accepting it, which is not really ideal, it's um, not really what you want to do. So we now have this concept of try accept and uh, in that case your, your WebSocket action will return either a right or a left. The left will contain a result, so in this case if the password doesn't equal secret. By the way, this is not a good authentication example. Uh, return the uh, forbidden result, and otherwise, if it's right, I return the way to handle my, um, my WebSocket. Uh, something else here, uh, in Play 2.2, the only way to handle um, messages, uh, the, the, you, the input and the output type of the messages had to be the same, which is fine if you're doing uh, uh, JSON support, so JSON in, JSON out, or it's for, if you're working with raw JSON or raw binary, binary in, binary out. But if you're working with higher level messages and you want to use them at that level, then it's a bit of a problem. So we actually now support different input and output types for, for WebSockets. And finally, uh, we support um, handling a WebSocket with an actor. So I've got this sum actor here, and using the ACA convention of defining its, its props in a certain method. So what I actually passed there to the WebSocket action was a function that takes the, um, the output actor to send to, so when I want to send something to the web browser, um, and returns the properties for a new actor. Now the reason why it doesn't return an, an actor ref directly is because Play will actually manage the lifecycle of this actor for you. So when the user disconnects, uh, the, the actor will automatically be shut down, which of course you can intercept using post-stop and things like that. Uh, also, when you kill, when the actor dies, or if you kill the actor, that will cause the WebSocket to shut down. So having a look at the implementation of the WebSocket, here's the input and output types. You can see some, I've then got a JSON format for that, and then I've got a frame formatter to um, say to that converts the WebSocket frames to and from um, the JSON, the um, JSON type. So then uh, here is my actual actor. As you can see, it's very simple. We've got a receive method. When we receive the sum method, then we simply sum the vo values, put it into a sum result, and then send that to the our actor. So that's, uh, that's the new WebSocket support. I'm now going to hand over to Rich to talk about... Oh, to talk about performance. Right, so performance. Uh, so I'm Rich Doherty. Uh, you can probably tell I'm a member of the Play team from my T-shirt. We always wear these T-shirts whenever we get together. And, uh, but we don't do dance routines. Um, so, uh, so on Play 2.3, uh, we worked on improving uh, the Java performance. Um, but um, I'm going to take a step back and look at also what we did for performance in Play 2.2 as well. Because um, uh, I think that'll probably be more interesting as well for the audience here. Um, so a few days ago, I went back and looked at the different performance for the different versions of um, play 
and uh, ran some performance tests. Um, and this is what I saw. Um, so what you can see here is uh, the result of some of the work we did in the different versions of Play. Um, Scala's the blue, Java's the red. I think you probably worked that out. But um, what you can see is in Play 2.2, we worked on improving the overall performance of uh, the Play framework. Um, so uh, this test uh, is for a very simple application with basically no application logic, just a very simple request and a very sim simple response. Um, so we reduced a lot of the overhead of the framework itself, um, and that gave a big performance improvement to both Scala and Java. Uh, but we did notice that the Java performance was lagging. Um, the Java API is actually a very small uh, wrapper on top of the Scala API, so there's no reason for it to be very different in performance. Um, so in the last release, uh, we've worked on narrowing down that gap. Um, and we've been pretty successful. I mean, there's a little bit more work to do maybe, but now you can see they're quite similar. I think there it's about 90% difference. In other load tests I've done, uh, it might be 89% performance. Some are indistinguishable, 97, 98% of the performance of Scala. Um, so how did we do this? Um, well, I don't know if anyone's tried to optimize their play application, but it's, it's not that straightforward. Um, there are some excellent tools for profiling Java applications. Um, we usually use your kit. Uh, thanks, your kit, for sponsoring us with some licenses. Um, so this is, if you, if you profile your Play application, this is what you'll see. Um, usually what I do is I um, capture method invocations, um, and you get information about how many times they're called and how long they la how long um, it takes them to execute. Um, but it is a bit tricky because um, in an asynchronous program, everything's split up into lots of small bits, so often everything has zero milliseconds as its execution time. Um, so really what you need is a bit of luck. You need to do some experimentation and run load tests and try different things and see what actually works. Uh, the thing which was probably the most significant for us um, in Play 2 and 2.3 for improving performance was reducing the number of th thread switches. So when you do a future map, you'll usually switch out to a different thread in a fork join pool. But we introduced a execution context which um, runs execution in the same thread. You need to be a little bit careful using that kind of thing. So we haven't exposed it as public API, but um, if you want to find out about that, you can come and talk to me about it. Um, uh, anyway, so it was, um, as you can see, we've, we've improved performance a lot in the last couple of versions. And yeah, I'm sure we'll continue doing more work in the future. But now I'll hand you up, back over to James again, who's going to talk about the future of play. Okay, so uh, it was okay, Chris, for me to go over, over time because we've got plenty of time now. Though we'll have plenty of time for questions, which is probably um, pretty cool. So. Uh, We've talked about Play 2.3, what is happening beyond two, Play 2.3. So uh, after Play 2.3 is going to come something called Play 2.4. And, um, but then really exciting, after Play 2.4 is going to come Play 2.5. No, actually we're thinking that Play 2.4 will be the last in the Play 2 release. And we're going to, after that, have Play 3.0. So uh, just like when we went from Play 1 to Play 2, uh, we're going to basically change absolutely everyone and alienate the whole community and start again. No. <laughs> um, so, uh, Play 3.0, we're, we're, we're going to target a number of big things. And we're viewing Play 2.4 as, I guess, a stepping stone to Play 3.0. So the things that we want to do in, in Play 2.4, in, in Play 3.0, anything that we can do without breaking source compatibility majorly. We'll try to do that in Play 2.4, and that will give us a chance to at least validate some of the things that we're going to do in Play 3.0, make sure that if we're going to change things, it's actually going to be for the better, not for the worse. And it will also give people a chance to hopefully start writing their applications in a way that will be compatible with Play 3.0 to, uh, to, yeah, get and, and start to understand 
it's what it's going to be like to write Play 3.0 um, applications. So Play 3.0 is going to have a new um, architecture and Play 2.4 will lean towards that architecture but be source compatible with Play 2.3. So in Play 3.0 we are going to uh, get rid of iterates. Well not entirely, there will still be They'll still be there, you'll still be able to use them, but they're not going to be there as the base level I.O. API. So uh, one thing, anybody uh, heard much about reactive streams? I attended the reactive streams talk. Reactive streams is really exciting. Uh, the play team, I guess, are, are one of the um, big motivators for reactive streams. I mean, there's lots of companies that have come together to that, that had a need for, play, for reactive streams, but play was one of them. Uh, our Iterates API was uh, just, it, it's, it's really nice, I love them. I have spent two weeks trying to learn Iterates and, um, and yeah, two weeks full time and I learnt them and now I can't understand what's so hard about them. So uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we're going to keep iter Iterates around but they're not going to be the base level I.O. Instead, we're replacing it with reactive streams. And what that means is simpler and also means it's usable from Java. You can't use iterates from Java. Uh, I've, I've never even tried. Like, I'm sure you can because, you know, but you, your code will just look terrible. So that's uh, the, uh, the I.O. Um, in Play 2.4, we're going to uh, introduce iter reactive streams as a bridge to iterates. So if you want to handle I.O. using reactive streams, you'll be able to do that um, by using these bridges. But it won't be compulsory and nothing will actually change in 2.4. Also, um, uh, we're also going to put, provide experimental support for Acker HTTP. And if you want to learn more about Acker HTTP, then I suggest going to the Acker HTTP talk, which is happening right now. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, those of you that have written a lot of tests in Play know that one of the problems of Play is global state. You can only run one test at a time. You have to set up the whole world just to write a single test. Uh, and it, it kind of, it, it's, the tests are nowhere as, as near as fast as they could be. You get all sorts of problems when you have multiple SBT projects because this project runs a test, that project runs a test, and they colli collide with each other. So our aim for Play 3.0 um, is to completely eliminate the global state. Uh, which is going to be an interesting, yes, <laughs> which is going to be an interesting task to try and do. Uh, obviously, it's going to ha um, have major consequences on the way you write your application. So it's not going to be done entirely in Play 2.4, but what we are going to introduce in Play 2.4 is uh, support for great dependency injection out of the box. So you won't have to use it if you don't want to, but we're hoping that you will be able to uh, write a Play 2.4 application in a way that is very close to entirely dependency injected. Uh, what this is going to look like, so uh, at, at the core, we're going to try and be unopinionated about how you do your dependency injection. The way we're going to do that is we're going to, anything that has a constructor or some sort of factory method for creating it, we're going to make that public API. So as long as you can create everything using public API, then you can manually wire your application together. And if you can manually wire your application together, then you can use any dependency injection um, method that you want to that is compatible with doing things manually. And then, uh, so, so that means you'll be able to, if, if compile time dependency injection is, is your thing, you'll be able to use that, you, you'll be able to use um, uh, things like the cake pattern, you'll be able to use uh, implicit provided dependencies. I don't know if you'll be able to use uh, the reader monad, uh, but you can try. Um, but we feel uh, for given plays kind of approach to being very, um, to, to having a very high really productive dev loops and to having things just work with no setup, we feel that runtime dependency injection is actually a bit of the better approach to, to go with play. And so for that reason, we're going to provide that as kind of the default way of doing things. We're going to update the documentation to push people in that direction. 
though we'll, we'll also have examples of how to use other approaches. And so out of the box, we'll be providing methods for using, um, for, for using juice, for having constructor injection, or for having everything in injected via constructors using JSR 330 annotations. And Play 2.4, I guess, is going to be our playground for seeing how well that works, particularly for Scala projects. We want to find out whether that's um, uh, a nice way to do code. So in Play 3.0, we're also looking at dropping um, support for Java 7. Uh, so we're looking at going to Java 8. Uh, there's two motivations for this. One is to make to allow us to provide new Java APIs that are really idiomatic to use from a Java perspective. Uh, so at the moment, a Java action is just a, a method that gets invoked with some annotations on it, whereas a Scala um, action is like a thing that gets built and can be passed around. And with Java 8, we can possibly make Java actions also be things that get built and passed around, which will bring these APIs much closer to each other and I think make it easier to, um, to understand play, especially if you're doing both types, both Java and Scala. Uh, also, Java 8 brings a number of um, improvements that definitely Scala 2.12 and beyond are going to take advantage of in performance. Um, so lambdas will work faster and things like that. So in 2.4, we're not going to be so radical as to require Java 8. Um, we probably will require a minimum of Java 7, though. Um, I think that's primarily because we'll be using ARCA 2.4, and that's going to require Java 7. So uh, thanks for, um, for listening. We, um, uh, Play 2.3 has been a huge release. We really want to uh, thank everyone in the community, not, pe not just people that have, that have contributed pull requests, but people that have tested, that people that have uh, contributed on the mailing list or in Stack Overflow. Uh, we play really isn't possible without the community. I mean, having 365 committers all to all time, it's uh, it wouldn't be anywhere near as good as it was if it was just us. So uh, thanks for that, and I hope you enjoy continuing to use Play Framework. Any questions? Okay, uh, first, first thing to say, the most recent round, oh, sorry, the question was about the Tech and Power benchmarks, um, and the most, the recent round shows a latency problems. Do you want to answer the question? I'll do my best, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, you know, I haven't really measured latency, so I'm not too sure how it's improved it, yeah. or maybe it hasn't improved it. I think, um, uh, yeah, I know, we, we had a little, we, we probably can keep, we should be able to have quite low latency, I think, because the amount of overhead we have on top of Netty or Arca HTTP is actually quite low, but we haven't looked into that. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will be doing um, now that 2.3.0 is out is um, seeing if we can interest anyone in the community in getting involved in um, maintaining the tech and power play uh, code, and uh, especially if people are interested in um, providing good uh, load tests or performance tests. Uh, that would be very helpful to us because we've, you know, we've got a lot of features we want to write as well. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, come and talk to me afterwards. Thanks. Um, yeah, so actually just for the second power benchmarks as well, so we did do a lot of work there. Um, if you actually, you know how they allow you to customize, like to filter the results by making more similar comparisons to think is, you know, they've just got a whole lot of stuff in there that it's not necessarily fair to make you know, comparisons of Netty raw to play, for example, um, you know, because we're very focused on productivity. So if you actually start filtering it by looking at, say, full stack frameworks um, and blah, 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 and you, you know, look at more represent uh, things that are more comparable, then actually play does extremely well in that regard as well. So it might be worth looking at the filters on there as well.
And there was one thing I was going to add. The most recent round was done just before we released Play 2.3, so you, you won't see the, the improvements. We actually do have Scala improvements in Play 2.3, and we're not 100% sure how they're going to pan out in the benchmarks, so it'll be interesting to see. Yep. So uh, you're talking about hot redeploy of individual model modules or just configuration? Okay, so the question was, uh, can we hot redeploy um, modules in, in production in Play? I know there are people that are using Play in an OSGI container. And um, yeah, that's Play 4, we're moving to OSGI. No. <laughs> uh, I, Yes, I'm told it's possible to use OSGI in play, and that would probably be the way to go about it. But I mean, I guess my advice would be to to uh, focus on writing um, applications that are small that start up very quickly, and so a bouncing it to um, is is very short. So, this is very opportune you ask that question. We're actually starting a new project called Reactive Runtime, which is our answer to Tomcat in the distributed world. And um, so I'm working on that. And um, so, let, you know, we can talk more about this afterwards if you like. Okay, so, th so the question is, uh, type safe console is no longer working with the latest release of Play. That's true. Um, I'm not sure if there is a plan to backport and release a new version. Type safe console is end of life now. We're not actually pushing it any further. We do have Activator Inspect, which is only one small part of type safe console at the moment. Uh, it's gonna grow. The other thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna work more closely with uh, monitoring uh, partners like New Relic and App Dynamics. Um, it's going to improve there as well. The other thing we're looking at doing is exposing tracing SBIs within Play and Aka, and we, we hope to see a larger ecosystem of tools, uh, including ones that you can write yourself. So. Yep. Uh, so the question is, are there plans to support pluggable reactive stream implementations? So, I mean, one of the nice things about reactive streams is that they define these very simple in interfaces that uh, all compliant implementations should be able to seamlessly interact with each other with. So from, from my point of view, it doesn't really matter which implementation you're using. If you want to use another one, um, it, and it's not the one that's play, that Play is using, you should still be able to um, use that. So our, the interfaces that we'll be providing in Play, at least that we've been kind of experimenting with now, uh, return the, the, the base level types. So a body parser will, be, um, will have a subscriber, for example. And so therefore, the out-of-the-box um, body parsers provided in Play will... will use ACA streams to implement them, but there's no reason, because it's returning this um, reactive streams API, there's no reason why you couldn't return a, um, you use a different implementation to implement a body parser. Uh, 
so the question is, uh, performance-wise, what do we expect from reactive streams? Uh, we haven't actually talked about this. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, the Acker HTTP team are, are working on putting what was spray on top of um, on top of reactive streams, and I think they haven't like Acker has done nothing to optimize reactive streams yet. They just they just like let's just implement it, get it compliant to the spec, and so in its current, current totally uh, alpha un, unoptimized form at 60% of the speed of spray. So they are very confident, they are very surprised at that, that it's so fast. Um, they are very confident that they're going to get that up to 100%. Um, what it means for play, so one of the things that makes play really slow is all this constant, um, uh, and, and with iterates, is all this kind of flat mapping of um, of uh, iterates, which ends up with futures communicating back and forth all the time, and um, with 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 iterates, you can only have one message in flight at a time because you can't pass in another message until the the iterate that that's receiving at the end receiver uh, redeems the future from returning and and stuff like that, and that um, is a significant performance overhead. Um, for iterates, uh, reactive streams doesn't have that. It uses it's, it says, send me another ten, 10 elements, and then sends ten, ten elements, and then when there's when it's received five, it'll say, okay, I'm ready to receive another ten, and so on, like that. And that um, actually offers, I think, significant potential for play um, on top of reactive streams to to actually be significantly faster. So. It's hard to say, but I think, would you agree, play should be faster on top of reactive streams? Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah uh, like James was saying, it's uh, not optimised at the moment. Um, we haven't done any performance tuning. Disclaimer, disclaimer, you get the idea. But um, one thing I'm really excited about is um, some of the combinators they're introducing give us uh, options for optimising um, uh, Multiple, multiple operations along a stream, um, optimizing them together and running them all in the same thread very quickly. Um, have less garbage collection, have less thread switching. I think there's a lot of possibilities for it to be faster than it is, uh, you know, than players at the moment. Um, but, you know, we'll have to see exactly how it works out. And maybe that's not something that will happen, you know, in our first milestones that we release. But um, I'm, our, our goal, for, I'm sure our goal for Play 2.4 would be at least parity. Um, or, or by the time it's not... For, for play three, by the time we, uh, it's the main production option for play parity at least, yeah. Yeah, just, well, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, it's all about improving performance as well because, um, you know, if you think play is slow right now, let us know because we don't think it is slow, you know, and, it, you know, compared with a lot of things, I um, mean, we're very focused on productivity. Of course, there are trade-offs, but, it, you know, I just wanted to highlight you know, we're not slow right now. We just want to get faster and faster and faster. Okay, thanks. Cool. Yep. Uh, so the question is, are we going to include Slick as part of Play Core? Slick will not be pulled into the Play GitHub repository. In, in fact, It'll be the opposite. A norm is going to be pulled out. Um, a bean is going to be pulled out uh, into um, projects under the Play Framework GitHub organization, just as as Play Slick is now. Uh, so, um, from a modular perspective, Play Slick is exactly is where it is now. Is where it will always be. Uh, but there's there's um, we want to to go further than that with Play Slick. So, at the moment, we don't really document Play Slick. In fact, I don't think we document it at all in players' documentation. So, we one thing that is on the roadmap for Play 2.4 is to add documentation for using Play Slick with Play to Play's core documentation. Um, and our, our, I guess, our activator templates which, uh, I mean, Activator now forms the play distribution, and our default Activator templates, are, which currently use Anorm, I think will use Play Slick. Yep. 
the question is, um, Acker HTTP will be available in 2.4, but how is that going to work? Will it be optional or what? Uh, we've been careful right from the Play 2.0 days to not let any of the Netty API, underlying Netty API, um, seep into the Play API. And what that lets us to do is completely transparently switch out Acker HTTP and Netty for, for Netty. Or well, no, switch out Netty for Acker HTTP. So in Play 2.4, we will be supporting both. Uh, so it will just, it should just be a configuration option or, or perhaps with a better dependency injection, you just instantiate this one or, or whatever. Yeah, so, um, yeah. It, one more question and maybe we'll take a question Yep, last question. Uh, we definitely, um, uh, we think that Acker HTTP will give us a lot of very interesting um, possibilities in future. So uh, uh, one interesting thing that we might explore is uh, being able to distribute requests across a whole play um, uh, a cluster based on load and things like that without needing a load balancer because it'll be running in play in an Acker cluster. You'll, you'll be very, it'll be much easier to, to know where to send requests and be able to distribute requests by role and all sorts of stuff like that. And so we're hoping that Acker HTTP will help us some, for some, with some very interesting deployment scenarios there. We also think that it's, it's a much better programming model, a much easier programming model to optimise and to maintain than, than Netty. So in, in 2.4, Acker HTTP will be experimental and I, I don't expect that it will be production ready then, but um, you certainly will be able to, um, the early adopters can try it out and give us feedback. Okay, so yeah.